here we are again, Triple R Studios. How's that? How's that? And the great man, Sugar Ray Nosti, to my right. How you going, oh, Ray? Welcome to my bungalow. Well, welcome <laughs> to my uh, Triple R Studios. Triple R Studio. Can't and down, wait. down the far end, Mike Big Roy Whitney. Dorsey. How are you, mate? Good, Good. to see you, Shugs. You all right? Oh, mate, I'm really happy. And I'm uh, Andrew Dorsey Dawson. As I always do, I throw it down to Big Roy down the end for the intro because we've got a, a different guest today. Always special, but yeah, a bit of difference. So, um, yeah, over to you, Widow. Very different guest today. Uh, we've sort of mainly had musos and sporting people on, I, I think, for, yeah. the, for the most of our podcast thus far. But we're going left field. Don't laugh, James. Yeah. Yeah. Before I interview you. you could be the last <laughs> one we have. I thought you brought me in because of my title as the Year Six Handball Champion <laughs> twenty years ago. Is that, I'm not here for sporting. Oh, great European sport. All right, all right. Look, this gentleman's an associate professor, and I want to ask him what that means. Uh, Bachelor of Science in Medicine, MBBS, Honours First Class, University of New South Wales, FRAX in Urology, PhD, Union New South Wales. Mate, the list of letters and numbers are unbelievable. I'm tired. And his experience in robotics, minimal invasive and endoscopic and open urological surgeon. Surgery. Very good. Did yeah. I get that out all right? You did. Would you please welcome Dr. James Thompson? Hello! Hello! Hello. James. Thanks, fellas. Thanks for having me. James, that's a lot. Let me start it first. What does associate... Relax with him. Mate, I'm pumped up. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I'm, I'm really pumped because I'll start like this. You're an expert in urology. That's men's health as well. Big mm-hmm. down there. We've got all the plumbing going on down there. Yep. We're not very good at going to the doctors and all that. And it's men's health week this week. It is International Men's Health Week. So wow. before we talk about that, what is an associate professor? Okay, uh, so basically it's a university affiliation. So if you work in a university, I work at University of New South Wales doing research and uh, into cancer and teaching the next generation of plumbers, yep. the urologists, <laughs> and uh, doctors, medical students, etc. cetera, then uh, it's, that's, you, you have a title just like you'd have a title in, in a company of, of, of sort of oh. your, your level of seniority so within that organisation. Yeah, so... And professor is at the top of the tree. Yes, yeah, an associate professor is, is sort of a step towards that. So and how do you get to be a professor? Is that just... So More you suck work, a lot of <laughs> <laughs> time, Sorry, time waste, a, waste a lot of uh, <laughs> nights uh, staying up late writing research papers and you know giving up weekends and things like that. But doing that can the help you now with AI, can't it? Oh yeah, I just w- I just I just asked Chat GPT to do it for <laughs> yeah, me right. now. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's oh, a great it's tool, isn't it? Hey, <laughs> get it? I tool. Wish. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> On top of all that. You're a conjoint associate professor, of faculty of medicine at University of New South Wales, Australian Prostate Cancer Research Centre Executive Committee, ends up Australian Prostate and Bladder Cancer Steering Committee, Prostate Cancer Registry Steering Committee. I mean, it just goes on and on and on. Impressive. I've had a busy life, brother. I mean, <laughs> I'm tired reading all this. How do you fit all of that in? And I want to start with this because you've already told me you've got a couple of kids and yeah. family's super important. Yeah. How do you manage your time being on so many of these committees, studying so hard? And look, my understanding is you're at the cutting edge of this type of robotic surgery as well. How do you fit it in? Good question. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I th- I, look, I think at the end of the day, like anyone who does what they love – you sort of enjoy doing it and it's just a natural progression of one thing after another that, you know, it's it's probably like you guys, if you got asked to be in another band and do a podcast and do a whole lot of other things, as long as you're enjoying those things, you don't mind taking something extra on. Sometimes you get overloaded and you think, oh my God, I really need to, you know, try and dial a couple of things back yeah. because there are only 24 hours in a day at the end of the day and you can't be, you know, the perfect you know, father and the perfect sort of urologist and, you know, give all your, like I supervise about 10 different junior, um, you know, trainees doing research projects and, and, and they all want time and attention yeah. with you. Plus, of course, the patients are number one when I'm at work in terms yeah. of making sure they're well looked after. So, you know, you you become better at managing your time, as I'm sure you guys know from, from your own lives. The busy, they say, if you want to get something done, give it to a busy person. Yeah. <laughs> and so I find the more I've got on, the more I have to be just ruthless in finishing things quickly and, and sort of timetabling my time well. But 
at the end of the day, you know, it's all it's all a balance. And sometimes I feel like I have to dial th- a few things back because yeah. we don't all want to be mm. at work and doing work 24 hours a day. You've got to switch off as well and have some downtime and, you know, have yeah. your family time but too. Dorsey, do you reckon he's busier than me? No. What do you call me? Ray's also known as the busiest retired bloke in Australia. There you go. <laughs> you can never get onto him, never answers the phone. He, makes, he makes shit up to do to make <laughs> no, himself no, busy. No, that's not true. Yes, you do. Busy. Do you know how long it took me to put all these records in order, <laughs> in year order? <laughs> but anyway, go daughter. Now, back to the start, like, uh, uh, where does your where did your passion come uh, from in this field? Like, how did you get started and, and what led you on the journey? I wanted to know, when did you, yeah, this is basically when did you decide to be a doctor? That's good. Cool. Well, yeah, so I, I sort of came from a family on my mum's side of doctors and, and oh, okay. nerds. I'd call us nerds, um, <laughs> researcher, academics. Um, so, you know, they're all, they all work in universities doing research experiments. One of them does lab rat experiments as a neuroscientist. Another one's a pure mathematician. Oh, yeah. uh, another one's a professor. I want to come professor. to your place for Christmas lunch, <laughs> man. <laughs> yeah, more. Keep going. Yeah. That's very interesting. Yeah, very it's interesting. a bit of a sheltered workshop sometimes, I have to say. <laughs> but, um, oh, uh, no, it's, and, and, you know, another one does, you know, refugee health and worked in the Pacific Islands doing volunteer wow. work and out in, you know, with Indigenous communities out in Burke for a long time. So it's all sort of people who are interested in research and education and teaching and that's so I sort of grew up with that on on my mum's side and my, my dad was totally different lawyer and you know sort of his brother was a hippie and everything else so very different sides but I think I, f- I actually was very close to doing law or business when I finished school and you know and I said you know what I'm before I make any big decisions I'm going to go along with my uncle who is actually an emergency doctor and he worked over at North Shore Hospital, Roger, and he um, he used to do that Westpac rescue helicopter yeah. where they used to go and pull people off the side of the Blue Mountains yeah. when they'd get lost. He pulled um, Stuart Diver out of the wreckage wow, and Threadbo. Wow. So he was like a, you know, a bit more of a sort of an action man. Yeah. And so I went and spent Hands a week. on. Yeah. So I went and spent a week with him and it was over up at, you know, North Shore Hospital in the emergency department. It was all drug overdoses and traumas and things. I was like, this is fantastic as an 18-year-old. Um, so that was pretty exciting. So I think that just clinched it for me. I was like, you know, you can... You can do something which has suited me as a nerd, being able to sort of do my science, but also I'm a people person, so you're looking after people. I mean, I spend my life like what I'm doing here now, just chatting to blokes all day, every day, and, and, and I love that. And, you know, I'm, I get to be a bit of a tradie as well. Like, I'm an action man with my hands fixing things. So, yeah. you know, it's sort of just, you know, like everything, you sort of fall into it in a way. But Dorsey, I think your question more was, when did you decide to go into urology and the plumbing areas of our body? Yeah. <laughs> was that after well, you do your medicine and then you go, I want to... I have to say that I'd be asked just every day by, by a bloke when I'm sort of pulling him up on the bed to do a prostate exam, he sort of looks at me sideways and say, why on earth do you want to be a urologist? <laughs> <laughs> that's when you snap the glove They look on. suspiciously <laughs> at me, snap that's that right. Glove on, snap. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That very, that very uh, sort of uh, vulnerable moment in a man's life. Um, so they um, look, I think I actually just, you know, I think in life you find your tribe and within within medicine, it's a very broad church of all sorts of different types. I mean, I'm sure you blokes have been to enough doctors. Mm. Of You see different types of doctors. You were talking before, Mike, about orthopedic surgeons. Yeah, and you know, Merv you saw Cross. Merv yeah. Cross. And he was, you know, he was a footy player, he was a rugby yeah. player, he was a good bloke. And so you tend, to, you tend to find like orthopedic surgeons are often like the sort of, they're like the jocks. You like know? the knock arounds. Yeah, yeah, you know, and they're sort of, they're like sort of chauvinist and they're talking about their Porsche and they're talking about footy all day and that, you know. And then you find, you know, totally other end of the spectrum, you're like radiologists who want to sit in a dark room all day sort of looking at scans and not talk to anyone. Yeah. And then you find, you know, so urologists I, I found, and I hear this from a lot of people, were sort of like a pretty happy bunch of people. They were pretty balanced, you know, they were... They like to operate, but they were also not too intense. I worked with cardiac surgeons, you know, heart surgeons and brain surgeons. I, th- I thought I might want to do cardiac or brain surgery. And they were just a bit too intense. They were sort of had this godlike ego and sort of narcissism. And they were there at work at midnight every night. And so on. And I thought, this doesn't really seem James, just, like my what, tribe. Have you seen the open chest and the heart game, the open melon and the brain? Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah, How was that? Oh, I mean, it's great. I mean, the, when you first – when you first – in heart surgery and you're seeing all the tubes. I don't want anyone to faint who's listening to this, but you know all the tubes of blood sort of going out oh. of the patient off to the machine. <laughs> sugar raised down. Yeah, sugar's hit the deck. <laughs> I'm not doing CPR. You guys can do that. <laughs> I brush my teeth. That must be amazing, but the yeah. first time you see them open up the chest and, and there yeah. is the heart. 
Yeah, to see to see inside the body and inside the brain and everything is so surreal, you yeah. know, at first when you um, you know, when you're a student and you're first in surgery and seeing people, you know, literally operating on other people's bodies and opening them up, it's intense. But so I love that and that's why I think early on I was attracted to that and I thought, oh, what's what's the pinnacle? It's a bit like, you know, wanting to play for Australia in cricket or something, you know, if you think what's the best, you know, brain surgeon or a heart surgeon sounds the most exciting and you know, I take my hat off to the people that Good do on it. You, mate. Good but on you. but I sort of felt like number one, it's very hard to get into that training. Number two, you go through twenty years of training, it's very hard to get a job at the end of that. But also I just saw them there at like eleven o'clock midnight every night and I thought they're probably not getting enough time with their families and you know, I think in life you want to have a bit of balance. You can go hard when you're a young fella, but you don't want to be there when you're sixty working at midnight, yeah. you know, or there all weekend. Yeah. You know, that's like not Benji my... Marshall does. You know, he balances it. Yeah. How did we get onto Benji Marshall? Because he said balance with the with the family. See, so he's a tiger. And tragic. he's gone to Fiji, <laughs> and he just and needs to mention it every time we're on the podcast. Yeah. Sorry, sorry to interrupt you. But I'm a North um, Sydney Bears fan, so oh, 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 that's, that's, oh that's you that's why the Bears are coming back. That's yeah. Shulk's wife. I, I, I hear we, that. I hear well, that. I asked the question, year. didn't I? To who did we have on uh, Dorsey? And I asked that question: When are the Bears coming back? Uh, we were in Vegas. Uh, Peter Beatty. Peter Beatty. Okay. Didn't give us I've much heard city, buddy. I've but heard it a few times, though. I won't won't but get my hopes up too much. Ray, tell James about Sue, your wife, and her connection to the Bears. Uh, her father was on the board for the North, North Sydney Bears, mm, and okay. as soon as he went on, they collapsed. No, <laughs> <laughs> he, was, he was very good, but uh, yeah, it was a boys club. That's where all the money went. It was a boys <laughs> club. It was a real boys club. Do you know what I mean? Uh-huh. But I've been listening to everything you're saying, and can I take one of your lines for my one of my songs? Because Ray's um, a songwriter I as well. Fa- okay. I, I found my tribe. Is that all right if I take that? That's yes, a all yours, man. great line. So you can see how I'm listening to the important stuff. Well, <laughs> I was going to say on the prostate exam, you said like being your old, just you need to be a people person. And I think your bedside matter in, in that regard, when you've got a bloke laying down and you've, mm. you've, you've put the glove on, you'd have to have you know, a real aware, awareness of of, uh, of the connection between you and the patient. Mm. So, yeah, that's... Um, and Dorsey, I've yeah. had enough operations in my life, and, and we've spoken about my double knee replacement two years ago, and Dr. David Bro, who we spoke about yeah. off air, yeah. he's just one of the loveliest people you'd ever meet. And for me, it's so important for your doctor or your surgeon, whether they mean it or not, to believe that they're really interested and want to help you out. Yeah. And the first day I met David Bro two years ago, over two years ago now, I felt that straight away. Mm. He cared about me. He wanted to fix my knees up. His bedside manner was just extraordinary. He's just such a lovely, lovely bloke and a top surgeon. It's very important to make that connection with your patient, isn't it? You 100%. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yep. I see a lot of people as second opinions that have been to see another urologist or, you know, a few other people mm. and they say, I had a few this week and they said, look, I went and saw this doctor but I just didn't get the impression that I yeah. yeah I just didn't feel like I quite trusted him or I wasn't sure about the advice he was giving me or so I think yeah I mean you know they're putting your life in your, in they're putting their life in your hands literally and I think you have to you know in my mind treat every one of those people as if they're your own sure. you know brother you yeah. know and and give them the the advice as if they were your best friend and you really want the best for them because and, and so I always, t- I, you know, have a lot of, you know, friends and family that will say, a doctor, and say, oh, I went and saw this doctor, I'm not sure. And I'll say, look, go and see this person because yeah. I, I, you know, I know often in a specialty that there's someone and I'll say, oh, that person was so much different. They really took the time to explain. I really felt comfortable with them. It doesn't have to be that you, you're, you have the same personality as that doctor. Let's face it, a lot of doctors like me are a little bit on the spectrum, but, you know, <laughs> you, you, but you need to feel like... Nothing wrong with that. No, <laughs> well, exactly. I was going to say something, but I held back. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, you have, to feel, you have to feel like you trust them, I think, yeah. don't you? And I think people have instinct and intuition around that, and I think they should trust that. I think yeah. if you go and see a doctor and you get the impression that something's not quite right, they're not quite explaining it, or you don't quite feel comfortable, see someone else. Hundred percent. Something you just especially said. as a bloke with this very delicate sort of stuff, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. The next Andrew question. and I talked about Andrew's next question. Yeah. We looked at each other when you said something. Then oh, I didn't uh, know anything about it. <laughs> no, you didn't. We left you out. <laughs> Thanks. What's it like every day or every other day having someone's life in your hands? Yeah. And how do you then switch off from that when you're away from work and and your mental health and all that kind of thing? How does that all work for you? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, I I think you you learn that skill over time in the same way that you know anyone in a probably a high stress job learns to find ways to switch off and 
you have to compartmentalize, don't you? You know, you yeah. can't. But I, I tell you what, I had a I had a dream last night that I was operating, doing one of these big. I do these eight hour operations wow. where we, uh, you know, without getting too sort of graphic, going and removing someone's whole bladder and prostate and taking the kidneys apart and taking the intestine mm. apart and rejoining the kidneys to the intestines and things. Eight and I, hours? Yeah, yeah. And I won't tell you what my dream was about last night. <laughs> <laughs> Continue, sir. Mate, that is... Yeah, I have... I know. What a, what, a, what a strange person that's I am, but long, that's my dream. But, um, a long time to be in surgery, brother. But, but you, you know, the, the point is, I you know, in that dream sometimes you're worrying about getting the whole team to get that everything set up and they haven't got the right equipment for you. So, so in a sense... It's always probably in the back of your mind. You know, it's hard to always switch off completely. I just, on the way here, I was having phone calls about, you know, patients and colleagues asking me for advice about patients and we've got patients in the hospital, in various hospitals all the time that you're checking in on. So it's always there, but I think you learn to, um, you learn to switch off and be present when you're at home with your family or with your friends and you have to, otherwise you burn yeah. out. I mean, that's the definition of you know, stopping yourself from burning out, isn't it? You can't do something 24-7. Yeah. So, Well, we talked about this on the phone, Widow, about today's interview um, and the fact that you've been in high-pressure situations when you're bowling for Australia and you've, you've got to get the ball in the right spot. Mm. But then... Get it, the ball. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> Otherwise, you're going to get hit for six and you get sacked from the team and there's 40,000 people watching and yeah. national TV. But yeah. then there's your level of stuff where... You've got, yeah, you're in surgery and you can't fuck that up. Like no. if someone's life is in your hands. So that yeah. pressure is, is sort of next level again. Next like level. A, I, what's I what's the insurance I, like? <laughs> <laughs> is it, no, it's serious. That's a lot. Yeah. That's a lot, yeah. Um, but I think in terms of... I've never thought about that, Shugs. <laughs> I, I think in terms of um, it is like being... A, a professional athlete. I love watching, you know, Formula One and basketball. I love it. I love NBA, the American basketball, and you know, you see those guys that get in. You put that game face on. They they talk about you know Kobe Bryant when he turned when he put his black mamba sort of like yeah, alter right. ego on, yeah. even when he was going through court cases and things. And it's like you slip that mask on and you go into that mode of complete focus and complete presence. And then you have to be able to switch out of that and take that that outfit off and then just turn back into your your natural you know your mate when you when you're catching up for a beer with your mates or being at home being present with your partner. Yeah. Because otherwise, if you're stressing and thinking too much about something, I'm sure, Mike, when you know, if you've got a big game the next day, you know, and you spent the whole night not sleeping yeah. because you're so, you know, focused on thinking about your strategy, then you're going to turn up to the game not, not in the best state. So you learn to relax yeah. and, you know, be really present when you're with your family at home. And, yeah. or, or for me, I, go, I like to get out in the ocean. So. Yeah. Bit of um, surfing, I did my research on that. Yeah, yeah, yeah and even oh, I mean, sometimes it's just to swim in the ocean. Sometimes yeah. if you don't have time and you're just ducking down at dawn as the sun comes up and diving in the ocean or having a, you know swimming a few laps is enough to just make you feel 100 percent present and like yeah. happy and grateful to be alive. Where do and you then, go surfing? Uh, I live in Coogee, so it's sort of Maroubra, Bondi around there, depending. I'm do about, they have I'm about there? to. Very much surf there. Not a you grew up in Matraville, Ray. Yeah, you but, know that the waves surf. were never like happening. No, not for you. For <laughs> all of us, we okay, went surfing. Uh, could you? Could you know? No, could you? Yeah, there's, right. no, there's no surf. There is there. Well, well I, 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 I used to go nah. in the pool, but <laughs> when it's really, really, really big, mm -hmm. you get waves at Coogee. When it's really big, and and the locals go out there, and and up near the surf club, there's a little reef there where the boys get yep. on their boogie boards and yeah. But it's pretty much a close out, isn't it? Unless yeah, it's really no, it's big. hopeless. It's hopeless. Yeah, and if it's I, big there, you can't surf at Maroubra anywhere else closing out. So you're yeah. walking distance? Or I, uh, yeah, yeah, yep. close to the beach Great. there. Fantastic. I, I grew up north side, so I grew up over surfing like Ooh. North Curl Curl. Go to the beach. You know, <laughs> Queen's <North> Cliff. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, um, like us, but I've gone to the dark side. Northern beaches. Beautiful part. <laughs> and then they go, well, oh, yeah. down south, they go. You know, we're part of uh, the Cronulla area and the Shire. And we go, <laughs> eastern suburbs, mate. That's the hub of the universe, isn't it? <laughs> but um, on, on to prostate cancer. For rugby league it is. <laughs> yeah, let's get back to what we're here for. On, on to All prostate right. cancer, I yes. believe it's is it the most common kind of cancer in men. Is that is that true? Or Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, if in, in Australia now, if a man lives to the, into their 80s, they've got a one in six chance of getting diagnosed, which is far and away the most common. It's the breast cancer in women and prostate cancer in men are far and away the most common cancers. And, you know, the strange thing to me is 
um, even I go along to the cricket and I see, you know, day three of the Sydney Test match or whatever it is being Glenn McGrath Day and they're yeah. all talking about breast cancer and, you know, yeah. amazing what they've achieved with that. Yeah. But Not prostate mention. cancer doesn't come up. Not you know? a mention. And it doesn't come up anywhere in sport. Boys, because we've, blokes. Got, we've saved Leichhardt Oval. <laughs> we about men's health. No. Yeah, no, no. Good call, right? Really? Good call. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Mate. yeah. Yeah. Um, Those so, stats, hang, hang on, Dorsey. Yeah. One in six if you yeah. make it to 80. Yeah. And, and just to be, like, clear, I see blokes, you know, every week who, some of whom are in their 40s, 50s. So it's yeah. not a – people yeah. – so there's a few things that I should probably – mention yeah, yep. that are the myths of prostate cancer which to be honest even get per like perpetuated even amongst doctors like even young medical students come through and GPs please. and so on which the biggest ones are that prostate cancer you die with it not from it I don't know if you blokes have ever heard that one but basically the idea is that it's not dangerous that you know it's this slow growing thing that a bit old blokes get but it's not really harmful yeah which is not true it's 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 not only is it the most common cause of cancer in men but it's actually one of the most common causes of cancer death second most common cause of cancer death after lung cancer which was smoking and that's probably going to reduce over time right so um it's going up and as we all live longer like 100 years ago the, the life expectancy of a bloke in australia a century ago was 50 yeah and now it's 80 to yeah. going up eight, going up every year so yeah. you know the reality is a lot more blokes are living long enough to get prostate cancer whereas maybe their dad or their grandfather you know didn't make it that far, you know, because everyone, they were drinking like a fish or smoking or, you know, got shot on a battlefield somewhere or had a car accident. So it's a real thing. And the other, so, so it is a, it is a, an important thing. The yeah. other thing is that people think the screening test is no good. The PSA test, you hear about the blood test, people yeah. think, oh, it's not reliable and, you know, so it shouldn't be done. Um, but it's actually a fantastic test. It is actually a really I good screening getting, test. I keep getting from the, um, the government these tests to do yeah, they keep hassling me about to do it. Oh, the PSA? Prostate? Is, is it the, is it, yeah. They, well, they, 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 they do the bowel one. one. That's me poo have one. Yeah, the poo one. Have thing, Ray? No, no, I haven't. Because <laughs> I've been busy with the band. <laughs> right? No, 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 and I'm not trying to be... Please, <laughs> Dom. I know it's serious. After That's this the colon, colon cancer. It's just been sitting there. But, isn't it? But I've had that many colon- colonoscopies, yeah. right, that I can't even say the word. <laughs> <laughs> But I, I had a blood test last week, and the yeah. doctor, I'm 49, and he says, oh, this time we'll, we'll do a PSA as part of the mm. blood test. Okay. So at what age, was it f- late 40s, that blokes should start so it having this done? Or? Definitely 50. Yep. So 50 is the sort of the government guideline that you should definitely get your first PSA at 50. If you've got a family history of prostate cancer or breast cancer, so if dad had it or a brother had it or mm. if, if mum or a sister had breast cancer, then they say even getting a baseline at 40 or 45 is helpful. Um, but 50, like everyone should be getting checked at 50, basically. And the good thing is, I mean, the other thing that blokes are afraid of is that, uh, that a blood test is going to then lead to, you know, the prostate exam. The dreaded prostate exam oh, with the doctor. Of the glove. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, they don't do that anymore, do they? Well, well, okay. I mean, the good thing is, yeah. in terms of blokes, if blokes are a bit cautious about getting in the door, the good thing is you don't have to have. But we're cool. We know we know James now. He'll be really gentle on us when we. I've got very small fingers. <laughs> but I have to have I have to have a blood test each month, right? Yeah. So I have to say to my specialist, "Can you add the PS, PSA? Is it? The PSA yeah, yeah, or test. your GP? Yeah. yeah. But I get everything. Would that be covered in there or not necessarily? Yeah, but you only need to have it once every year or yeah, two. Yeah, but I have to have it because I got psoriatic arthritis. Oh yeah, right, yeah. yeah. So but if I you did it, methyl X trait, whatever it's called. Oh yes. All right. You know, the cancer, the cancer drug. Yeah. Is, that is that a cancer drug, isn't it? The one that you read, methyl extract. Methotrexate? Yeah, that's it. Methot- yeah. yeah, I can't even yeah. say it. I've t- been taking it for that long. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's, yeah. So yeah. if you, but if you go and get, if you went and get it checked once a year or once every two years, yeah. that's fine. And your Jeep, you know, most blokes, when they're 50, they should be going and, you know, getting their blood pressure checked, getting their cholesterol checked anyway. Yeah. So yeah. they just pop it on. It's not an extra blood test. You just do it all Part at the same time. And, and um, cancer, a cure, like a, how, can I ask a question before that, Dorsey? Yeah, sure. Why do we get prostate cancer? What? Why do men get it? What's the reason? That's a good question. It's to be honest, we don't really know. We know that genetics. So if it runs in families, then you've got an increased risk. We know that as you get older, that every time your body is constantly, all the cells in your body are constantly dividing. Yeah. 
And every now and again, they can make a mistake. Just like if you are driving a car, you know, every day for a thousand days, you could have a little mistake one day and have a crash. Um, that every now and again, uh, any sort of production facility can have a slight error. When the cells in the body are dividing all the time, sometimes a little, a little bit of DNA, the little sort of uh, blueprint that, that sort of drives cells and tell them what to do, can have a slight error in communication between the DNA and the cell. And that can lead to a protein being switched on or switched off that shouldn't be, and then that turns into a cancer cell. So, it's, so that's it's, why it happens more with age, because you know as the cells get older and they've re- replicated thousands and millions of times, it's so more it's likely to have a mistake. It's not so the food that we eat. That's what I was right. going to ask. It's not he smoked and drank, or he was a karate expert, got kicked in the nuts 20 times, <laughs> or, or his diet yeah, was good. this. That's, you know. It doesn't relate to it at all. Uh, generally, no. So look... Smoking, drinking, all those things do what about increase a lot. Bonging on, bonging on. I know. I'm just asking for all our followers. Yeah. A lot of bongers. <laughs> who are bonger oners. Bongers. A bonger honor. Bongers. <laughs> Thank you, Widow. On the bong. That's <laughs> what he's trying to say, folks. <laughs> I'll just, yeah. I'm just, I'm just a bit nervous with you here. You know? You're asking for personal, personal advice. No, here. no, no, no. Yeah. I just wanted to add that because people might want to know. Well, geez, I have a bong. Yeah, no. Nah. Yeah. The the good news with prostate is like. There's nothing that blokes have done that it's their fault. Do you right, know? So if right, someone gets lung right. cancer and I they've been smoking a too. pack of Benson hedges every day for the last twenty years, yeah. chances are have lung you might. Problems, yeah. not prostate. But, yeah. yeah, prostate is not from anything like that. Now we think that the healthy diet of the same things. People always ask me, blokes say, "Oh, look, what's the best? Is there something I can take that's good for my prostate?" Can I? You know, these days we live in this era of supplements. You know, you go to the bloody health food stores and there's millions of supplements and you can guarantee there's a whole wall of prostate supplements right and they yeah. they you know those pharmaceutical companies and vitamin companies they're happy to take your money but the reality is most of that stuff is not really scientifically proven to make any difference it's just about having a healthy diet the same things that are good for you unfortunately in terms of brain health and heart health which is you know not having too much fat and you know red meat and having you know plenty of veggies and not eating too many calories that's the same thing that will basically look after you in terms of your heart health, your brain health, but it's also the same thing for your prostate health. So when people try and get too confused, I have patients that come and see me and they bring in a bag of 30 different supplements and they say, I've got, me and my, I've got the supplement for my heart and I've got the supplement for this and I've got the supplement for that. And I say, no, you just need to have a healthy diet, a healthy, balanced diet. And and that will be, you know, so you don't need to overcomplicate things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so back to my other question of, of a cure for cancer, like... Um, yeah. Will that ever happen, or, or and if so, how far down the track? Or that's probably a stupid question. I don't know. It's it's that's already it. happened, Dawes. The conspiracy <laughs> theorists say that there's a lot of money in cancer drugs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we need to speak about that. We're going to have to end this broadcast <laughs> right here. <laughs> well, can I just interrupt for a second because uh, uh, some important news has just come up, and I wanted to let everyone know that um, a loved-up Michael Clark has been spotted for the first time with his new girlfriend Arabella Sherborne while holidaying holidaying on the Gold Coast. That was a minute ago, and that was the big news. This is a breaking story. Yeah, this is Michael Clark, the extra Australian cricketer. Correct. Yep. And what are you watching on that iPad? Mate, you want, what, 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 <laughs> no, get I'm, that kombucha off him right now. What, what is in that kombucha? Is there, is there vodka in that? What's yeah, in this it? is like That's my 10-year-old <laughs> son. He's just busy watching YouTube while we're doing the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> well, Pup Clark will be really happy for that mention. Good on you, Pup. <laughs> Yeah, so um, his, his prostate's getting a workout. Is that the reference? <laughs> yeah, that's it. That's uh-huh. the reference. Okay. That's it. Well, actually, I've got some good news for you, which is that prostate cancer, one of the things they say that's good for prostate cancer is to um, have sex a couple of times a week. So yeah, that was one of my you can all, you can all let, is the same? Well, well, well masturbation a couple of times a week. It depends if the wives are listening to the podcast <laughs> and girlfriends. So, no, because we don't want them just to tell the bloke to go and sort themselves out. So if you want to, if you want to tell your, your girlfriend or your yeah. wife or whatever that, you know, Dr. James said that you have to be getting it at least two or three times a to week, then good luck to you. Ray's going to be cutting the audio out of no. this right now and replaying it to Sue yeah. every day. <laughs> no, no, I, I don't need to. Um, oh, what? Oh, um, oh. Oh, you're a lover, aren't you? Yeah. You. So I've got some of our followers who follow mm-hmm. the How's That podcast have yep. asked for me to ask you some questions. Oh. Um, one of the questions is, I have an erection all the time. Uh, how, what, what can happen? Is it because I take Viagra? Yes. <laughs> uh, next question, thank you. 
the next one is, is it true? All the time if means, you don't if you have an erection you all the time, you should go to hospital. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Something's very wrong. Well, you, you know we actually see blokes like this but all the time. That's really? correct. So blokes come that's to... Correct. Really? So to Blokes come to hospital. No, James. Yes. Yeah. That's partic- why I brought it up. My, my questions are legit. I know all of these... All of these, around, all of these friends of yours <laughs> yeah. are... Um, I won't mention your names, but yeah, they're they're all Gaza friends. and JJ. My friend was wondering... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He's got a bit of a lump. Can you take a look? Yeah, yeah I know. Yeah, so um, that you, you get that. They come, yeah, yeah, so they come to they come to the emergency department... Um. With an erection. So the rule is in urology, if your erection lasts more than six hours, then it's a then it's a medical emergency. Because basically an erection is the, the penis fills up with blood. Six hours, I know. I'm sure I mean all the you listeners of this after six hours. No, but all the listeners of this podcast would go all night, I imagine. So six hours for them is normal, right? <laughs> that's, that's, yeah. that's one of your sessions, right? Six hours? Six hours is, yeah. you know, the afternoon. And, um, well, no. <laughs> bit of afternoon delight. Six minutes no. is a long time. <laughs> <laughs> you got the, you got I can't believe you're about to tell me that you've seen patients come yeah. in and gone, I've had a fat yeah. for 12 hours yeah. and it fucking won't go down. And it bloody hurts because it's like a, a – it's basically what happens is an erection is blood going into the penis and it doesn't come out. So after a bit of time – there's no oxygen getting into the penis anymore. So it's like having, you know, the blood circulation cut off to your leg or something. Oh. Or it's like having a heart attack, having like a penis attack and <laughs> <laughs> having a knob attack. And so basically if it doesn't go down for six hours, then they've got to come in. We've actually got to then – it's a pretty awkward thing I have to tell you with these blokes. They come in, you know, under the sheet. They've got a bit of a um, – <laughs> Pitching a tent in the sort of hospital bed sheet. You're not taking the piss, are you? No, I'm not taking okay. the piss. Right. And, uh, you can't say that to a urologist. You can't say that to a urologist. You're taking the piss. Right. right. Uh, Sorry. Thanks, I, I, we're bringing back the piss. We're not taking the piss. I was right. waiting for the dick jokes to start. Yeah, that's right. No, but so these guys are pitching a tent. We actually have to go and put a needle into the side of their penis and pull all the blood out. Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, no. And if it doesn't work, we have to take them to the operating theatre. Why do we always... But just, often it's because they've taken too much Viagra or these other things like around... We see a lot around Mardi Gras I'm that sort of thing down at, I work at St. Vincent's Hospital and St. George Hospital in Sydney and, and we see it around Mardi Gras time, these blokes that take too many drugs, they, you know, ecstasy, cocaine, this and that and pump, you know, a handful of Viagras and they come in 24 hours later and, and oh. they're in all sorts of trouble. But DJ, that's Dr. James, I'm calling him DJ. <laughs> um, but you have to have those specialised doctors at the hospitals when people come in, don't you? Yeah. Not any doctor can just go, No, that's okay. why we're on call 24 hours a day. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. My yeah, but question we rotate. is... Mm. If they don't go in and they've had the the erection for like twenty hours and they don't go in, yeah. what eventually happens? Like, is that serious? Yeah, yeah. Like it's it, it will. You can blow a gas. It will go. It go. It will go gangrenous. Oh, yeah. Why do we? I just <laughs> grab myself. Then why do we? Yeah. Do that? Like, don't you? You yeah. see, when we were playing cricket, you'd see someone get hit in the nuts, yeah. oh. and we'd all grab it and then laugh. Yeah. <laughs> we're talking but, about that. How many times have you copped in the nuts in in, yeah. the, in cricket when you're batting? Yeah, a couple of couple of times were, and I never got hit full on. I never got hit right mm. in on the box, yeah. just on the side. Mm. Like, fucking take knocks the wind out of you. Yeah. Too. Usually, but, we see blokes that come in after um, motorbikes or. Bicycle injuries, they're the ones that they hit the they hit the handlebars oh. right in right in the family jewels and um they Coming can actually the blown up nose. they can actually they can they can pop it. Oh yeah. and then you gotta take it out. Well, yeah. so, <laughs> just one thing. So if you do the Spanish bangle, will that affect anything? <laughs> Can, you'd have to demonstrate the Spanish bangle. Uh, well, I will after sugar, the right? yeah, podcast right. finishes. I'm not going to do it live on air. Thanks for that, Shug. Thank God but this sorry, is not. Mate. Thank God this is not a video that's podcast. Right, that's that's right. Right. <laughs> when we do video, we'll get you back. We'll yeah. get a, spe- a special edition. <laughs> <laughs> but all the other types of cancers you deal with: bladder cancer, testicular cancer, yeah. and um, that's I th- was it. Testicular cancer is the most common cancer in men aged 20 to 39. Is that yeah, correct? Yeah, very good. Very yeah, good. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Um, Why is that? Well, because not well, young blokes don't get much in the way of cancer generally. So the only one they tend to get is testicular, and it's again, it's a sort of a random genetic mutation. Again, not because they've done anything yeah. wrong, just bad luck, so to speak, as as with a lot of these cancers. Uh, but it does run in families or well, blokes who had an undescended testicle. You know, where when they were a baby and they yeah, first came out, it didn't come down. Didn't Sometimes drop, if yeah. they had to have an operation yep. when they're a bit older, yep. so that testis was maybe never quite normal. That can lead to it, or family history, that sort of thing. But we don't do any screening for testicular cancer. So blokes are supposed to check themselves in case they notice a lump. If they notice a lump, 
uh, that's not painful or anything, then they're supposed to get checked out. And they're supposed to, We, you know, we used to sort of go around saying they should get checked they should check themselves once a month, but I think it's fair to say most twenty-year-old blokes are probably examining themselves <laughs> once a day. So, <laughs> correct. That's not usually. They usually notice pretty quickly. <laughs> well, but the problem is they notice pretty quickly, yeah. but then they 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 put their head in the sand, like us blokes are very good at, and so they don't get, then get checked. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For until until the thing's the size of a you know cricket Why ball. Why are we like that? Why well, are men? <laughs> Stop it, Ray. <laughs> Why are we like that? We always go, ah, it'll be right, it's a fucking lump, it'll go away, or whatever it may be. We are, men are legendary at that, aren't they? You know what I've noticed is the difference between men and women is women from the time when they're 20 or, you know, earlier, they're going along to the GP for all their female health check stuff. They're going yeah. along to get their contraceptive pill. They're going along to get their pap smears. Yeah. So they're very, they're almost like it becomes part of their normal routine. They don't see going to the doctor as a big deal, right? As you know, the girls, when they're, when they're 20, 25, 30, 35, they're going all the time every year for all that. Whereas blokes don't have to go to the doctor for anything. Mm. And so I get all these blokes that come in in their 60s. I've never been to a doctor in my life. And, and, you know, they may not look like the healthiest specimen, but because they haven't gone to a doctor, they say this is a badge of honour yeah. that They're they really haven't gone to a doctor. Yeah, yeah, and they sort of see going to the doctor as a sign of weakness. And uh, and they're just not in the habit of it. So to them, the idea of when you turn 50 or whatever, that you then go to the doctor and start having checkups, they're almost afraid. It's like that's a sign that I'm getting old if I'm doing that or oh. that's a sign that, you know, that what I'm going to open some can of worms yeah, once I start yeah. checking things that I don't want to open, you know. Mm-hmm. I don't want, oh, I don't want to go to the doctor. Next thing they'll be wanting to do all these tests on me mm-hmm. and then I'll be having – they'll put me on tablets having procedures. That's sort of a bit of a denial of, yeah. of – get. I mean, none of us want to get old, right? So – uh, we yeah. know. How many times have you been to the doctor? Now, and this is really important. What, lately? Yeah, lately. I go out to the Australian Creators Association Health Day twice a year, mm-hmm. and that's where they do all the bloods, that's good. skin, and they change it around sometimes. They'll do bone density one year, and they'll do... If you go to yeah. both, you get covered off straight away. And the last couple of years, because my knees, yeah. I've had to go and see the doc. But, yeah, I'm, I'm not good at that. If it wasn't for the Australian Cricket Association's health days, where we can go out as a member of the ACA and get everything done, I probably wouldn't be as good as that. Yeah. Yeah, I think for the last... 35, 40? Yeah, 28. 28. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, probably the, the last... Botox, I think. <laughs> The last four or five years, I think I've had a, a blood test every year just to knowing that I'm in my mid or was in my f- mid forties mm-hmm. five years ago, mm-hmm. and just making sure Pretty that good. if anything good. happens, it can get picked up. Or um, and I try and eat healthily and exercise. And although I'm not perfect, but it's you know realizing that yes, we're you know on the downhill from fifty to, you know, and look DJ, after ourselves. Well, and I think a lot of blokes, a lot of blokes you, are working full time. Yeah. How, how, how often do you go to the doctors? Uh, I'd be going. Really? At least once, I'm, I'm in my early 40s and I'd be going at least once a year for my general okay. check. I like to get my skin check, you yeah. know, because I want to make sure I don't want to get a melanoma or something terrible that, you know, can, can be a big problem for young blokes. That was and a also, one. you got a melanoma, there you go, yeah. And I've got fair skin, so, yeah, you know, we get terrible, yeah. you know, sort of uh, cancers. So and, you don't um, check yourself out or anything? <laughs> I've had the occasional patient that over the years this tells me that they've done their own prostate check and it's fine, which I'm usually very sort of traumatised by. Um, <laughs> they snap the own blood on. Yeah. Put a bit of vaso on the malmaning and reach around. around. <laughs> yeah. Fair yeah. Give themselves a Do reach they around. they know what they're looking for Well, or I had one, for? had one bloke recently who was one bloke recently who was like a taxi driver who used to be a GP in China and he said, oh, you know, I know how to do it. So he'd been, I've been doing my, I've been checking it every week and I'm thinking, holy moly. He's checking more than his prostate if he's snapping the glove on every week. So <laughs> please don't try that at home, fellas. I don't want anyone doing that. I don't want anyone, I know we all like a bit of a DIY. I know myself, it's like my last resort is actually to call a professional if I need to fix something around the house, but please don't check your own prostate. On to uh, robotic surgery, because I sent the guys a video of you, yeah. you know, talking about how you do the robotic surgery mm. and that's just a... Yeah, how long has, have you been involved in the robotic side and what does it entail? Yeah, I mean, robotic surgery has been like a pretty amazing revolution in um, prostate cancer and bladder cancer surgery and kidney cancer surgery. In, in urology, urology has really been at the forefront of robotic surgery. It's probably the specialty that had the biggest benefit out of it compared to other surgical specialties first for various reasons. I won't get too technical about that, but essentially it really started only in the last... 
10 to 15 years mm. that it's really come about. And before that, so prostate cancer surgery, I often see blokes when, when they've got prostate cancer say, oh, my dad had his prostate out for prostate cancer and they had to, you know, cut him open with a big cut yeah. and there was lots of bleeding and complications scar and all tissue. these scar tissue and they say, oh, yeah, all those terrible problems afterwards and um, uh, I say, look, a lot's changed now compared to when your dad had his prostate out, you know, 20, 30 years ago compared to now and a lot of blokes are amazed who've, who've gone through the journey of, of having prostate cancer, robotic surgery with how quick their recovery is a bit like keyhole surgery for joint stuff as opposed yep. to having to have a full knee yep. replacement, yep. you know. Um, they're sort of walking out of hospital the next day and, you know, they're, they're you know, back to their normal activities. I saw patients this week who are sort of six weeks down the track and they're saying, oh, I'm already back on the golf course and I'm, you know, back to, back at work and I'm doing these things. So it's been quite revolutionary in terms of being able to, instead of doing a big cut and having a lot more risk of complications, now the risk of complications from the surgery is much lower, like yeah. really small and the, the recovery is a lot quicker and they're just getting little keyholes. Like when people get a keyhole uh, gallbladder removal or a keyhole appendix mm. or a keyhole hernia, it's all keyhole surgery now. And the robot is the sort of technically, because the, the surgery we're doing is sort of we're trying to attach structures that are only a millimetre in size. So wow. you sort of got sub, you know, when we're removing a prostate, it's attached to a lot of critical structures in the body, all the sort of nerves and blood vessels for erections and the bowels a millimetre away behind it and the bladder and sphincter a millimetre away above and below. So you have to be sort of within that precision level. Within of Within that millimetre. <laughs> yeah, or often a tenth of a millimetre. when mate, we're that's, in the, not a, that's not big margins. No, it's they? not. And so the robot has really enabled us to magnify our vision. So we're zooming everything up threefold and then we're getting with these little instruments. Imagine it's like your human hand but it's about the size of your thumbnail, right? And so imagine if you could shrink your hands down to the size of a thumbnail but have the same precision. And you can oh, even magnify wow. you can even magnify your movement. So if you want to do a movement of opening and closing your fingers, you can actually make that movement a third of the size. So the movements can be mic- like microscopic movements. And you're, you're actually, you know, we're actually not even um, next to the patient when we're operating on them these you're days. On the video, so you're we're on the video, you're on the workstation, aren't yeah, you? Yeah, we're on the other side of the room. You know, they talk about once we get to the level where, you know, Wi-Fi speeds and, you know, sort of internet connections can are rapid enough. Home, yeah. yeah, exactly. I won't <laughs> have to leave the bedroom. <laughs> yeah. But, How but even for blokes in... you have to do to come up to speed with that? Uh, well, I mean, the full training is 18 years. Wow. But the, the, the robotic training itself is really probably about... Uh, Five years, I'd say, but of, that's of, of forward the more so dedicated robotic. You, you, you've got to be yeah, it's all changing. Up with, and is there AI involved in that? Actually, the latest generation of robots that are just about to be released, which I've been hearing about this last week yep. and, and few weeks, are, are starting to incorporate AI yep. so that when you're training to do these operations, it can give you real-time feedback using artificial intelligence about mm. how to improve your economy of motion, which wow. is like how to make your movements more efficient and how to learn if there's been any, you know, you can get feedback from the operation afterwards and say what what could you have done differently. So you're learning in the same way as these artificial intelligence models are Quite learning incredible. all the time it, un- because all of your like movements that. are captured by the computer. So it can save all of your three-dimensional movements. And it's just movements. running an algorithm over that saying, if you do it like this, it's much more efficient yeah. and it's better for the patient. Uh, yeah, exactly. Wow. Would it get yeah. to the stage where you wouldn't need a surgeon and the, and the AI could take control of the whole thing? Would it get, ever get <laughs> to that level? I've got to slow it down at least until I've, I'm retired <laughs> enough. Where Worried about yeah. doors. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, it probably will, to be yeah. honest. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Sorry, um, sugar. In 2009, mm. I was, Dr. Pillinger said to me, I was the first one to have robotic surgery for, wow. for hemorrhoids. So wow. At Ride Hospital. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And I said, you've got to be joking. And I thought it was, you know, the robot from Lost in Space <laughs> was going to do something. Warning, but, but that's, warning. Would that been, would that I saw R2-D2 right? out the front. 2009, <laughs> would that have been correct about then? Would in it, Australia? You so, I mean, he would probably be talking in Australia for that specific procedure. Correct. So it happened a yeah, little bit yeah. before that in prostate surgery okay, and other yeah. things. So but like, that was for that, yeah. Oh, it's St. Vincent's saying, Hospital. We're trying this before, out. Yeah. For you on the first, you're, you're like the guinea pig. Did yeah. you and the robot yeah. have a cigarette after? Or? <laughs> no, <laughs> no, they were really good friends, but I don't know. But they had gaff tape on the guinea pig. But yeah, that's about right. It's been about it's been about fifteen years. 
So yeah. that'd be about right. That's yeah. amazing. So yeah, you were one yeah, of the so first ones. Yeah, yeah, I was one of the. He first told ones. you that after the operation, did he? Not before. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I had, to say, I had to sign this form. Uh -huh. Sign your yeah. life away. Yeah. <laughs> so if it doesn't work, bad luck. We'll we always say we we'll say don't do it read the old this, way with a knife. Yeah. <laughs> Anyway, but um, yeah, yeah so with the bladder cancer too. I see you yeah. you're obviously working with with women as well. So you, you're yeah. getting to see both side, both the, the men's health issues and, yeah. and women's health issues yep. as well. So you differences between men and women as well. Like in, oh. in terms of dealing with them as as a patient, or, or there no difference? Um, not not really. You know, I think the the big difference is in dealing with blokes. Um, the hardest part of our job is often dealing with blokes around uh, probably the prostate cancer mm. stuff because of the potential effect of prostate cancer treatment on sexual function or, you know, urine leakage. So that's the sort of the big black box. That was black my box. next question. Yeah. Yeah. If you have your prostate mm. out because it's really bad, yep. is it that? Is it you can't get a fat anymore? Is yeah. it you got urine leakage? Don't yeah. say fat. Mm. Erection. Thank you. Nah, that's good. Yeah. <laughs> we know what we're talking about. Yeah, crack a fat. Is that what happens? Um, yeah. <laughs> so it depends. And this is why, you know, the blokes that get tested and checked and found something when it's small, when it's the size of a pea and it's well contained in the prostate, nowadays with the robotic surgery and there's, I mean, there's other treatments we can talk about as well, but with treatment nowadays, not only can you cure it, but also you can usually cure it with minimal side effects. So a lot of these blokes come back to see me, you know, six weeks later and they say, my, my sexual function's fine. You know, I just, you know, had... I had sex with a missus last night and it was pretty good. Maybe I'm popping a little blue pill, a little Viagra tablet sometimes yeah. to help things along. But a lot of blokes, you know, if they're in their 60s or 50s or whatever might be doing that anyway. And so yeah. um, they can actually get – they can get back on the horse, no problem, if you get it early because the little nerves that are on the side of the prostate within that, like, millimetre, if you can get the, the cancer when it's not on the edge and hasn't gotten out, right onto those nerves, then you can save the nerves, you know, and then they often do well. Whereas if you if you don't get checked and it gets found later when it's more advanced, then you have to take more of the – you have to take a wide – what we call a wider margin, which means you've got to take some of those little surrounding things like the nerves to make sure you get all the cancer. So, yeah, you can still – you can get a very – so to answer your question – I've got lots of blokes where if they if they get it early and they're in good health and their sexual function is good before the operation, there's no reason why they can't have a healthy sex life afterwards. If you don't go and have the blood test, and not that you're anti that, you just haven't gone, what are the other signs that you should be looking for to say? Like, I've got some mm. mates that stand at the toilet for fucking three minutes before they start <laughs> having a leak. And they told him. I was we, thinking well, I should start advertising them. on the urinals at the, at the pub because <laughs> that's when you give us something. And then <laughs> also, again, some of my mates, they go to the toilet 15 times a fucking day. Yeah. Now, are they the signs that you've got to be looking for? No. Well, no, is the short answer. So the, the problem with prostate That's cancer... That's good. We're, in good. We're all right then, mate. We're doing good. <laughs> if it, if it takes just, you 15 minutes... I'm just about minutes. to go now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we've got a couple of buckets under the table here, don't we? So I've, I've, That's what they're for. I've, I've catheterised everyone before we started, so there's no interruption. No, the, um, no, the, uh, the, the unfortunate thing with prostate cancer is it doesn't actually cause anything any symptoms at all that you can pick it up before it's too late. Oh, that's the problem right. with prostate cancer. That's so, why the checks. That's Correct. why the checks. So like yeah. say, you know, say, so I do bladder cancer and if you start peeing and you see some blood in your urine, yeah. then you should get checked. But a lot of the time... You can't see it. That Well, well, a lot of the time if you're peeing blood and you go and get checked, they'll find it early and, and fix it, you know, so we can get it. But there's not a screening test that we have to pick up bladder cancer until it's caused those symptoms. But you can still catch it at a curable stage usually. With prostate cancer, there's no symptoms that are a sign that you've got it until it's already spread or at an incurable stage. So well, you can't on, wait then, until you're having trouble peeing. Well, or, why do we have trouble peeing when you get older? Well, that's a different thing altogether. So there's three things that happen to the prostate as you get older. One is you can get prostate cancer. doesn't cause any symptoms, so you've got to go and get your blood test checked for that. Two is enlarged prostate, which is some blokes, and it's not all blokes, but some blokes it tends to run in the family and uh, um, there's a few other things that can contribute to it, but that can cause your prostate to grow larger. And the prostate is sort of like the drain pipe under the kitchen sink, you know. So if, if the prostate gets too large, it sort of narrows that drain pipe, which is directly under your bladder. 
And so then the flow's slow, just like your kitchen sink or your bathroom sink's a bit slow to yeah, drain. Yeah, yeah. Your urine's a bit slow to drain. So then you notice the flow's a bit slow. But blokes don't even notice when their flow's a bit slow, to be honest. They say, so what if it takes me a minute and a half to do a wee and it used to take me 30 seconds when I was 18? doesn't bother me. The time when it starts to bother them is when they're waking up a few times at night or when they're having Absolutely. to go frequently or when they're having to go more frequently or urgently yeah. during the day. You know, yeah. they're, they're running back and forth. Or they, yeah. you know, blokes say, oh, I was driving yesterday and I had to pull over on the side of the road and find a tree. Yeah. You know, that's that. So that usually means that their prostates may be enlarged to the point where it's starting to cause a problem. Why do you get it's not enlarged? draining? But if, sorry, but, but if I well, don't drink, yeah. I'm fine at night. If I don't have, like, yep. me cup of tea and me a kombucha, kombucha and a yep. glass of and, water yep. and wine and yep. beer and stuff, <laughs> <I'm okay. laughs> why does it get enlarged? Uh, so the the three things that drive it are age, so you can't do anything about that, genetics, and you can't do anything about that, and then we talk about metabolism, which means if you – the same things that cause, you know, diabetes or whatever, if you put on weight, have a bit of a bigger tummy, that sort of thing <clears> – <throat> That core, that releases little hormones that cause the prostate to grow. So if you want to keep, you know, and blokes ask me this all the time, if you want to keep your prostate healthy, if you can keep the weight down and keep yourself fit and look after the diet, that will stop your prostate overgrowing. But, you know, there are blokes I see who are skinny as, super healthy, like absolute, you know, mega fit, but because they're, you know, 60 or 70 years of age and because it runs in their family, their dad had it and their brother had it, they're going to get an enlarged prostate anyway. So, you know, again, like there's only so much you can do to fight against age and genetics. Um, but the good thing about if you've got an enlarged prostate is if you get that re... You know, if you get it early, often we don't need to do anything. So I see lots of blokes and I say, look, we're just going to keep an eye on it. We're not going to put you on any tablets. We're not going to do any procedures. We'll just, you know, I'll see you, I'll see you next year for a checkup sort of thing. Um, but if you get checked and it seems to be more of a problem, then if you get it early, often you can take a little tablet, you know, which might be a once a day before bed, you take a little pill and that just helps to open up the prostate and help you pee better. So it doesn't mean you have to go and have an operation. And if you do need to have procedures, like some blokes need procedures, we've got all these minimally invasive procedures these days that you, it's not necessarily going to cause any problems with, you know, sexual function or urination or anything. So like a lot of blo- like you were saying to me earlier, Mike, about by the time you went and got your knees replaced, you said, shit, I should have done this 10 years ago. Yeah, yeah. You know, a lot of blokes come to, to see us with, you know, their prostate problem. They've been, they've been waking up five times a night to go to the toilet and this and that. And then, you know, if we do treat them, they say, oh, I should have, you know, should have done this yeah. years ago because, because their quality of life is so much better. You know, it's like turning back the clock 10 years. Suddenly they can sleep through the night again or suddenly they, can go to the go and watch a movie or go and watch a footy game without having to go for a, a so piss what, three times. What do some of our followers? What would they ask their doctor if they were going to the toilet all the time? What well, would they say? To, would they tell them that's what I'm doing? Their yeah, their doctor should know what questions to ask. But if they say I'm having a bit of trouble, you know, with the waterworks, yeah. yes. that's all you got to say. Really, okay. you know, you just say, oh look, I'm going a bit more at night, or I'm going a bit more often during the day. I'm having this problem. And they'll take, you know, refer you to a specialist. And they'll, yeah, and they'll say, look, you know, we'll get you an, maybe an ultrasound, yeah. maybe, you know, basic urine and blood test, and then and then get you off to see someone. And, you know, if you see a sensible urologist they, and, and things aren't too bad, they might just do a, do a checkup and say, actually, you're all good. Or they might offer you a tablet and you can try it and see if it helps. If it doesn't help, no worries. A bit like if you've got sinus, I often say to blokes, it's a bit like if you've got sinus problems. Yeah. Sometimes you go and see the, the doctor and they just give you a spray for your nose yeah. and that fixes it up and beautiful. You don't need anything. Sometimes if it's really bad, you got to get it sort of cleaned out. Like if you, you know, like I, I consider myself a plumber for what it's worth. And you know, sometimes you can put the Drano down the sink, the yeah, little tablets, sure. and it's easy and it, it unblocks yeah. it. Sometimes you got to call the plumber and he's got to get the snake in and actually unclog it properly. But yeah. you know, it fixes the problem if it's needed. But that's only in the more severe cases. So on the mental health side of things, and uh, it's Mental Health Week for men, which you alerted me to during the week. For oh yeah, text, and I didn't, yeah, didn't International know that. Men's International Health Week. International Men's Health Week. Yeah. Now what you do. <clears throat> is part of your training mental health so when you have patients come in you you can see signs whether they've got mental health issues or is that something separate that they would go and see someone else for as well or how does that work yeah i i mean i consider myself only in charge of the man brain which is the one down below yep. rather than <laughs> the one up top so it's a very it, powerful strong brain <laughs> that sometimes on the, yeah. from this perspective if yeah. uh, you know if someone's having a near death experience and you've you've helped to save their life right. after, after that yeah um, do you point them in a direction to go to get a mental health sort of some uh, help or they could that's what yeah, their own, own yeah. volition or i mean of course, I mean, I've had, you know, lots of, um, you know, people in my own circle of friends and family, things with mental health issues, and that's a massive thing in blokes, you know what I mean? That's a, oh, yeah. I mean, there's yeah. lots of blokes who, 
should be popping off to their GP and having a chat to them about the fact that they've been feeling down or whatever. And But blokes, unfortunately, we're not like women who are fantastic about sitting around and talking about our, you know, how we're feeling and, and sharing that. Blokes tend to sort of... What, am not- I a bit of a girl? Because I don't <laughs> mind sharing. You said it earlier, James. It's a sort of like it's a weakness in men if you go and do yeah. that stuff. Oh, you're weak and you, you know, step up to the plate. But yeah. it's particularly with mental health now. Yeah. Blokes are much more comfortable about talking about like even when I'm talking to the other bloke surgeons and anaesthetists at the hospital, the, the comfort zone is like what's happening in the, in the sport and you go around the yeah. grounds of 10 different sports yeah. and you talk about what's happening in the AFL and what's happening in the rugby yeah. league and what's happening in the basketball. But but no one ever says like, you know, how are you feeling today? Yeah. And, you know, are you all right? You yeah. know, like that sort of doesn't happen. But I think, um, I mean, I think blokes are getting better Compared to the previous generation, I think every generation is probably a bit better than the last, but I think that's – I mean, mental health is a massive issue that blokes should be keeping an eye on their mates and keeping an eye on their brothers. Well, that's it. I've lost a few really close friends. Have you? Yeah. And so anyone that rings me, or I I can see they've got a problem. Yeah. Ray's really good at that. You know, I'm just on to it straight away. Yeah. But if that didn't happen to me – that I, I lost a really close friend. You wouldn't be on. Yeah. I don't think I'd be like that. I'd be going, oh, come on, you can. A lot get of over us it. learn the hard way, don't yeah. we? Yeah. You know, it's only yeah. once we yes. lose someone, then yes. we're then we're aware of it, yes. and that's yes. the show. Even in my yeah. circle of friends, when we go and have a drink, I'm very um, aware now of, of asking those questions yeah. and opening those conversations, and not just talking yeah. about football or cricket or whatever. Just yeah, how how you really go, and it's surprising how many blokes, when you ask the right way, will actually. Yeah, well, I'm yeah. not going that well, yes. Dorsey, I know. Yeah. Isn't that amazing? Because yeah. I'm tending to do You're that good now. Too. Yeah. How are you? No, how how are you really, brother? Yeah, how are you and really? And they go, yeah. oh, I'll be honest with you, widow, yeah. this has happened, and my yeah. son's son yeah. works at this, and they're not good. Life's so bloody complicated. I asked him. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, what are your tips for next weekend? No, <laughs> yeah. no, so, um, no look, I think, um, you know, life's so bloody complicated these days, isn't it? I yeah. mean, every second yeah. person's, you know, getting divorced. Everyone's got financial stresses, bloody interest rates are going to – everyone's work is like, mm. you know, getting pumped and work, you can't escape it on the weekends and, you know, everyone's got family issues and then mental health things can – I've had, you know, within my family that you think someone's fine and next thing you know they're they're in hospital yeah. with, with depression and yeah. you think, holy shit. And then you can, you can look back and say, oh, work wasn't going that well and they had a lot of stress and they had a baby and they weren't sleeping and maybe the marriage was – but, geez, it's hard to say. People, you, know, it, it, you really got to look carefully to pick up the signs. But I think opening those conversations yeah. is fantastic, absolutely. So we touched on this briefly before with your surfing and, and, and mm. basketball. So obviously you do that kind of stuff to to uh, get away from the stuff that you're dealing with at work and uh, yeah. to sort of recharge the batteries. And um, you're still playing basketball now or whatever? Yeah, look, I mean, I think every bloke goes through that transition, isn't it, where like when you're 20 – you know, and in your 20s, you're so free, you can do whatever you want, you know, and you've got so much time to go and play golf and go for a surf and do whatever and play in the band, you know, if you guys are seeing music. You're like, but I think what happens is once you're busy, like we all are, and then if you've got, you know, a, a busy job, if you've got kids, you, got, you know, you're running around after everyone else. You're constantly trying to please everyone else. So I think it's really important, everything I've heard from like, you know, um, sort of, uh, you know, thought leaders in this sort of mental health space to say blokes have to find what's that one thing that they love that's really important to them. And, you know, for you guys, just like for, for say, my brother-in-law, I know it's it's music, you know, just sitting down and just, you know, yeah. punching out the guitar on the drums. I've actually, my son who's 10, I've just bought him one of those electronic drum kits Beautiful. and uh, I'm hoping that's just a release Big for him. Big mistake. <laughs> oh, no, he can put the headphones It's electronic, it's right, electronic. So right. I can't hear a thing. It's fantastic. Um, but he loves it and you can see that release, you know. And for yeah. me, it's and, and I've got other friends where it's surfing and yeah. it's just like that is their that is their meditation. Yeah. That's their release. That's their like their place where they can escape and go to. And you can't do, you know, when you're in your 20s, you can do all that stuff all the time. But I think even when you're busy, you have to like prioritize your own mental health and physical health to say, I, you know, and you have to tell, even if it's, even if you're busy with work and wife and kids and whatever it is, you still got to tell people, I need to do this for myself. And if I, and when I see people who don't do it, they end up having a nervous breakdown or they end up, you know, having a heart attack or something. And the people who do do it, then it, it recharges your batteries to then go and give back to the kids and all those things. Because if you're doing nothing for yourself, uh, you just get drained, I think, over time. Yeah, so. I've got a few mates who play golf with once every couple of weeks and we don't, it's just not about the golf. Like We hit a, a rubbish shot and we don't care. It's yeah. just like down the fairway chatting yeah. about Growing. what's going on in their lives and stuff. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, it's a good, good I, I love, I even like, 
when I used to live at Maroubra, mm. um, I used to just like watching the guys surfing. Yeah. That was a really good release. Yeah, I, I'd catch up with you on, on yeah. just watching them. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, Do you tune really in and watch important. the WSL on the, on the TV, the surfing, the world titles and stuff like that? I used to a little bit when I had KO sports, yeah, yeah, but yeah. I sort of I can that, so I don't really anymore. I mean, it, to me, it's not so much. If my my competitive sport that I love to watch is basketball, but surfing for me is more about just being out out in the ocean, in the and, ocean and watching the sun come up and feeling yeah. that. You sort should of, try to watch the squirrels. Um, oh, no, who are the squirrels? Oh, the, the mad squirrels. <laughs> the We've mad taken squirrels. on a, a yeah. bit of a mascot. They're a rugby league side from the Czech Republic. And just <laughs> yeah. the, best, the, the, best, the best club name of all Unbelievable. time. So. Yeah, yeah. They've been mentioned to Peter Beatty, Premier, ex-premier. <laughs> Wayne Pierce. <laughs> Wayne Pierce. Eric everybody Grove. knows about the mad squirrels. Hang on, are they league. playing in the Czech Republic? Are they yeah. the only yes, team? Yeah. No, no, so no, are they no. the reigning champions by default? I or? think they are. No, no, there's a competition. Yeah, so they They've gone viral, have they? They have now. we we, we, we watch all the mid We actually had Troy Grant in here previously, who's a, a former um, New South Wales Premier, and he's the, the chairman of the International Deputy Rugby Premier. League. Deputy, Deputy Premier, 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 sorry. Yeah, yeah. Um, and he's the chairman of the International Rugby, Rugby League Board. So okay. we were talking to him about our love for all these Minnow nations playing rugby league, and he was right across it and stuff yeah, like right. that. So, yeah, yeah, that's that's part of our passion, yeah, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, we just thought we'd throw that in. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we do that every podcast. We okay. try to. James, just on sport, you said you're a North Sydney Bears tragic. Go the Bears. They're not in the comp. You've got to be... Go the Mighty Bears. You've got to be barricade for someone else. Oh, to be, can I be honest? I don't really follow much rugby league these days. Good, because if you had said because I'm a Bears fan, <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. There's yeah. no way I'm going to go for the uh, the. Well, if you live in used, Coogee, I used Coogee's to follow more South Sydney territory now than anything he's, else. He's working on. I you. used to follow. <laughs> no. I used to follow Manly a little Ooh. bit because oh, I was because I surfed either. because I surfed Manly. So, so, the Northern you know, Eagles. We yeah. hate Manly, it's but they were sort of our enemies at the Bears as well. So it's a great game. They cost the Bears. They took yeah. the bears on, and then yeah. they said a couple of years later, cut. See you later. Yeah. Yeah. Boo. We're going to try. And, we're going to try and take yeah. the podcast to North Sydney over, aren't yeah. we, Ray? Yeah, we, we are. We really are. There. Yeah, yeah. Because we, we, I heard you guys talking about Desi Hasler, um, and he's with, with Spud yeah. the other uh, yeah, the other yeah. week, yeah. and I, you know, um, Danny Hasler, his his brother. Was my was my teacher at oh, school? Really? Danny yeah, Hasler. Was Desi yeah, Danny. was a teacher originally too, yeah, wasn't he? Yeah, yeah. yeah, and they were like, and they weren't twins, but they were like Desi pretty young. Um, they were very that. close. Was they his were very hair close. as good as Des's? Or was yeah. it even better? Even better. Well, even you know, better. They call Desi the mad scientist, and sometimes in the interviews, I watch it and I go, "You look like a mad scientist." <laughs> but look, he I looks like a mad. One of the guys that used to uh, be our masseuse when I was playing for cricket New South Wales well, for New South Wales, he was also the masseuse for Manly. And he told me that Desi was the first, he was there before anybody when he was playing. Yeah. He was at training before anybody. He did this unbelievable fitness routine before everybody turned up. I believe Then it. he trained with the side. Then he was there another hour after that doing more shit before he left. There must have been something in that family because his his brother Danny was the strictest teacher we had. The whole, wow. and I went to a Catholic school, so it was pretty, you know, as that saying Your a bit. boys. No, nah, a school called um, Aloe, St. Aloysius. Okay. So oh, you're, yeah. a man, you're a manly boy, are you? Uh, uh, our guitarist uh, teaches I grew yeah. up sort of uh, Cremorne. Right. But I surfed over manly. Okay. That was yep. where I'd yep. go on the weekends. Yep. But um, Glenn, yeah, I believe teach. it. Yep. Glenn St. teaches St. Aloysius. Yeah, Glenn the guitarist from our band, Oz Icons, teaches Glenn guitar Farina. at St. Yep. Aloysius. There you go. Does he? There you yeah. go. Yeah. He's a pretty good guitarist. Small world. He's a great bloke. But on basketball, do you go and watch the NBL at all, or do you watch that or not? I take my kid along to the Sydney Kings yeah, yeah. because you know like they've got to see it live you know yeah. seeing it live I, mean, I remember watching the Sydney Kings back in my day it was like yeah. you know Steve Carfino and the yeah, Keo yeah, brothers and all those guys yeah. was it Hill was it Dean Utoff yeah, yeah. Oh, that yeah. Was Shane Hill the guy that started all was that Mike Wobleski the D train yes. and and I think he only passed but away a few years ago Mike became the commentator yes. but without Mike Wobleski Yep. I got, hope I got that pronunciation right. I met him a few times in the yes. early days. Yep. He was so passionate about basketball. Yeah. Without him, Australian basketball wouldn't be where it is now. Yes. Yeah. 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 It, it kind he of had a fell vision. Off a bit. Yeah. Well, no one, mate, when he started that competition mm. decades ago, everybody went, huh? Are you for real? What, what's this yeah. shit? <laughs> I know. Yeah, it was pretty, it was pretty big massive. in the 90s, wasn't it? Yeah. And oh, then Sydney massive. teams, don't yeah. forget, two Sydney teams. West Sydney. one out west. And we used to go and see that at, where was it? At, 
down in the Olympic Stadium. Before the Kings, oh, yeah. at, near there. there was yeah. the Sydney Supersonics and the oh, West Sydney yeah. West Stars. Yes. And then they joined forces. And there was the West Sydney Razorbacks you were talking about. Yeah, that's ah. it. Yeah. The Razorbacks. You're a basketball fan too. Yeah, well, I played, I think, under 16s, New South, New South Wales Metro. I made it to that level. Oh, that's pretty impressive. And then I was a bench player at that stage. And I thought, oh, music's going to take over here. So. Uh-huh. <laughs> Yeah, There's right. more chicks in music than <laughs> bench playing in basketball. Right. Can we just get back to that? another question from yes. our viewers, from our listeners? Okay. Um, yes. Can you ask DJ that um, <laughs> that I have got m- my penis is like a banana shape? Is that Peyronie's disease? Yes. And who is Peyronie? Oh, it's a great question. Well, historic. <laughs> Peyroni, okay. My penis is like a banana. It's what like a banana. It goes like that. And he goes, the girls love it because it gets the G spot. <laughs> <laughs> but if it ain't broke, don't fix it. <laughs> well, he's just worrying about something about the disease. No, nah, it is a common. Skin, it's a common thing. It? It's a common yeah. thing. So I mean, uh, Peyronie's, which is basically just the the condition where the the erectile tissues of the of the penis that that tissue gets a bit of scar tissue in it, and normally it's like an elastic band. So normally when it stretches. It expands all equally, but if you get a little bit of a like a fixed um, bit of fibrotic scar it, tissue in one spot, off you go to the side. Off to it can go left, right, up, down, spiral, or this every direction. <laughs> it can be in yeah. swing, out <laughs> swing. <laughs> I've seen a few sort of warny, pretty heavy leg <laughs> leg spinners go. <laughs> sort of, uh, yeah. So, what was the um, guy's name? Peroni, was it? Yeah, well, he was yeah. obviously you know, the for, first doctor that discovered it, wasn't yeah, he? That's was right. it? Oh, it was. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so it there, wasn't a we got all these a big what we call eponymous. No. <laughs> well, and Peroni's no. an Italian name, and you should know that because you're Italian. Yeah, well, the bloke who asked me that was named Mario. So it was, um, <laughs> and then they started a beer company called Peroni, and that they went from there. <laughs> <laughs> it fixes it. That's, that's the treatment. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and I only say that because it makes you a, worry about it less. That's, that's an infection, and, and you would. Do yeah, no, well, yeah. yeah. So actually, yeah. it's. A, I mean, it's a good point that if blokes notice any curve, so yeah, it only curves when they've got an erection. Right, so when it's just sitting, you know, sort of resting, so to yeah, speak, having sure. a snooze, yeah. then they're not going to notice it. <laughs> Limp biscuit. But when they, uh, <laughs> yeah. when they, when they crack a fat, so to speak, yeah. then it's going to um, curve left, right, front, you know, up, down. Leg and break, then yeah. the good thing is, yeah, if they notice a bit of a leg break, then they've got to get onto it early. <laughs> yeah, sure. Because if you get onto sure. it early, you can start taking tablets, which we use like a little Cialis, a bit like a long-acting Viagra and anti-inflammatories, and you can actually stop it getting worse. Okay. Whereas if you ignore it, which is what a lot of blokes do, and they come to see me a year or, or two later and they say, oh, it's really bad now, I say, you should have come see me a year ago because it would have been easier to treat yeah, them. Yeah, sure, it's um, like everything. So if they yeah. leave it a year, yeah. it's the big warning leg break. It's like really <laughs> yeah. turning and gripping and It's like turning. the ball of the century, yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, is it true <laughs> when he says it yeah. does hit the G spot? Would that be right? Because If it's curvature? going up, if it's going yeah. up, it could be handy. Oh, you, could yeah. Yeah. you could root around okay. the corner if it's on the side. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. so, I, I knew really we were going to get to this level at some stage. They have to experiment with new positions. Yeah, that's right. You have to adapt. <laughs> will, will, you know, yeah. would like to hear that. Advice. No, that's good. No, but yeah. and also sometimes we actually have to use, believe it or not. You know that you ever hear, hear of traction? Like when people used to break yeah, their bones back in yeah, the day, yeah, and they put their yeah. leg on traction no, to help you don't line put the, the old bones up. In traction. Yeah, we put the old fella in traction <laughs> because <laughs> the old smorty, <laughs> the smorty in traction. <laughs> Jesus, I do, I tell you what, word. if you had to put Joel Garner in traction, <laughs> it would have been three foot long tripod. Tell a story, story, story. <laughs> Years have heard this before, but I actually made a mistake in one game in England. It was Ian Botham's testimonial, and, and Beefy got a World Eleven together versus a West Indies Eleven. Had a few beers in the dressing room. I thought, I'm just going to go to the shower with the towel on. I walked in, and they were all in there, the West Indians. Right. And you'd heard all these stories, you know. And it was like, <laughs> <laughs> and then I got to Joel Garner along the line. Fucking hell. I just said to him, they go, what's the problem with us? I went, that black anaconda hanging out of your guts is the problem, bro. And I'm going back to the dressing room. I am not showering. And I walked back and went, fuck, it's all true. Those guys are just like, and they tell you once they have it black, they never go back to girls. The girls, you know. Yeah. But they can't take it. The girls can't well, take I don't it. Know, but no, they can't. Fucking, I don't know about Joel Garner. Oof, he the man. Big. That, they didn't call him Big Joel because he was six foot nine. I'm telling you, unbelievable. How do we get onto that? What was this? Men's in? health. Men's health. Men's health. He's very healthy, Joel. <laughs> 
Oh, but I think we've got a barbecue coming up soon. We have got a barbecue. Should we finish up? Should we finish up? Is making. Yeah, well, Peter's Meats, we'll give him a plug because it's... All this talk of sausages is making you (laughs) (laughs) want to throw a few snags on the barbie, is it? I've got one Uh, more question. Have we got one more question each before we finish up? Because I'll finish up with the last question. If you've got any advice to any of our brothers or sisters listening now, Mm. particularly about men's health, Mm. what would you say to them now? Go once a year or whatever. What would you say? I think the big message would be get checked. If you like, so if you've got any symptoms, go and see someone because, it's, you know, if you're afraid that if you go and see the doctor, that then that's going to lead to some, you know, you're not going to be able to get it up or you're going to be wet in your pants or you're going to be have rushed into some operation that you want to avoid or put onto, you know, you don't have to, but get information. Do you know what I mean? It's like if you, if you go and, and see someone and get checked, they might find everything's fine and then you've got peace of mind. You say, great. Yeah, yeah. If you, it's like uh, it's like asking your mate if they're okay. You're never going to regret, yeah. you know, asking if your mate's okay. If he's fine, great. But if you don't, something bad happens, you know, you'll regret it the rest of your life. I get all these blokes that, you know, say, I should have come and seen you years ago. Mm. So go and get checked. Tell your doctor and just say, look, I've got this, you know, bit of a, I've, I saw a bit of blood in my urine or I saw I've, I'm paying a bit more or I want to get, you know, my, my prostate checked because don't always rely on the GPs to 100% initiate it. Some GPs might forget or not do it or not believe in it or whatever. And so, you know, so you should... have got to go to a GP, then get a referral to come and see you, right? Well, no, if right? you go and see the GP, often they can do a lot of those basics. Yeah, right, you might right. not even need to see a urologist. Right. You know, if you, if you go and get your PSA check and it's fine, that's Happy it. Happy days. You yeah. get checked a couple of years later. You yeah. know, it's like if your cholesterol's yeah. fine or your blood pressure's fine, you don't have to see a specialist. If you are if you go and see a good GP and, the, you know, you've got a few urinary symptoms, they might be able to give you a trial of a little tablet and you don't even need to see a urologist if you're okay. So it doesn't mean you have to go down the whole sort of path of next thing you know, you're having specialist things and then you're having procedures. Not at all. But I think the, the, the worst thing you can do is if you've got any symptoms at all is to ignore them because you might regret that big time. So And, and just be proactive in looking after your health. Same for your pro- – I mean, go and get your prostate checked once a year when you're 50 and at the same time get your cholesterol checked and at the same time have a chat to your GP, get your skin checked, Blood you know. Blood sugar, all that Blood stuff. Blood sugar, all yeah, that yeah, stuff. Yeah, and, yeah. you know, I mean, yeah. it's just that thing of blokes just aren't in that mindset. Like, I'm busy, I'm working, I've got the kids, I'm doing this, I'm playing golf, you know, and they're just not in the mindset. Whereas the women, are, they're used to going and seeing the doctor every yeah. year, no problem. They're comfortable with it. So blokes have just got to think if I'm proactive and look after my health, well, I'll, I'll you know, be in good health and, and happy and and prevent problems like a stitch in nine, you know, stitch in time saving nine, you yeah, know. Yeah. Fix problems early and then you're going to be, you're going to have good quality of life and be in good health when you're 70 and 80 and enjoying your retirement and all those things. Whereas if you ignore something, that's when you see, you know, you miss you miss what we call the window of cure. You know, that's when you, if you leave it until it's too oh, late. Another good the line. window of oh, cure, yeah, right? Oh, down see, down. that sounds like a lyric. Now, James, you seem like a lovely bloke, so get a couple of sets of gloves out. We'll be in to see you in a couple of weeks. <laughs> Just line <laughs> us up. Yeah, we <we'll> <laughs> Can I ask you a couple of sets? A <laughs> couple of sets. You want me to double glove, do you? <laughs> <laughs> a double glove. Can I ask two quick questions as my last question? You go, Ray. Okay. Um... Is a urologist? Are we covered by Medicare? <laughs> yeah. So have you? Gotta be. Yeah. So have you go and see? Yeah, yeah. There's Mate, so no, there's no, there's Medicare covered clinics, and sometimes you yeah. might if you go Do and see a urologist those? in their private rooms, yeah, yeah. you might have to pay an out of pocket. You get some back from Medicare, but you might have to pay a little bit out of pocket. Like the, the usual two fifty or three hundred. Yeah, exactly maybe that sort of thing. Eight hundred, no, no, eight hundred, thousand, or something. <laughs> no. Okay. And my final question is: Thank you for that. Uh, my final question is: um, Music. Yeah. What do you like listening to and what are you listening to at the moment? Oh. Got anything? Well, that's a great question, Ray. Yeah. I because like we're a music kind of yeah. It's a really yeah. sensible oh, question, yeah. right? Yeah. Thank you. I, look, I like all sorts of things. Um, depends on the vibe, right? So if I've had a big day of operating and I really – or if I'm going to a big day of operating and I want to be like just in a, in a peaceful, chilled state, I might put on a bit of like – just jazz music or even a bit of like classical and then but if i'm if i'm sort of uh my partner laura as you know is a singer so if we're like on a bit of a road trip then you know we might be belting out some like 80s sort of you know rock songs and and singing along or we might be i love uh hip-hop actually yeah, i have to admit fun. i don't know if that's considered music by you guys yeah, but i no, like, yeah. I like uh, which, is, which is really good at hip hip-hop he, he, he <laughs> knew a bit of hip-hop from cheech and chong 
Last question from me. Do you actually have do you have do you have music on while you're operating? Yeah, we do actually. Yeah. And again, it might Gay depend Dorsey. on. So, like, you know, famously, uh, one of my nieces, another surgeon, I operate with. Like, at the end of one of those eight-hour operations, when we're all a bit sort of oh, man, at the I tail end, and we're just that. needing, to, then they'll start pumping the rage against the machine to start, <laughs> so finish things up. But then, when you're early on and you're in the serious bits, then it might be the classical going. And I'm thinking of James now, me preparing to go out and bowl. He's preparing for the <laughs> in the morning, the test match. I've got a big test match dun, on the day because if dun, I fuck this up, the dude's dun, gonna dun. die. Man, that's pressure, brother. That's pressure. They don't die. It's okay. Good. <laughs> it's okay. We'll definitely come and see you then. Yeah. Fantastic, mate. We've never lost one yet. I trust you. Yeah. <laughs> as, as Widow said, we'll be in the three of us. I said double, double glove double up glove. and we'll, we'll be in. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you might need two for me. On that note, <laughs> what an enlightening conversation. Oh. Thanks for your time today, James. We really appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you. And how's that? We'll try to do something with... I mean, sing like yeah. we did for Leica. And yeah. You've done something just by having me on. Absolutely. You know? We have getting that the message out there. That's it. Getting the message out. If there's any boys out there that have got any dramas about going to see a doc, well, James, we're coming to see you. <laughs> Double gloves, <laughs> all right. Or give Dawsey a call. Whoever your local <laughs> urologist is. Thank you so much, yeah. Dr. James Thompson, for being yeah, on the House of Arts podcast. Yeah. Sensational, mate. Thanks, brother. Thanks, wow. fellas. Over and out. See you all next time. See you soon. See you soon. That's unreal.